the complexity, you know, the systems that we brought together in this one place to do something that very few places in the world do, you know, launch, launch humans to, to uh, a low Earth orbit and, you know, hopefully with the new program into, you know, farther reaches of space. Uh, so when you go to a system or a place like that, you can't help but be overwhelmed. Every space shuttle mission began with a fiery liftoff from Launch Complex 39 at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. The Launch Complex for the Space Shuttle had two pads, Pad A and Pad B. If the launch pads demonstrated anything, it's that complex is the right word for the two pad areas that handled the shuttles for about a month before they made their trips into space. Outfitted with everything a spacecraft and its crew would need to take the final leap into space, the pads handle fueling duties and crew support and help precision machinery for a range of payloads. It's graded floors and gray paint along with armored boxes for instruments, telephones, and elevators reveal a style more Spartan than space age. You always find something that you didn't know. And you've got so many systems uh, you've got system level experts and technicians that have been out there for so many years, you know, dedicated, essentially, it's many of them, their entire careers out there. Even though, yeah, it's a lot of steel, a lot of wires and lights and tubing and that kind of stuff, um, it does inter it interfaces to, you know, a flight vehicle, you know, so you have those complex interfaces and there's always something to learn. It may look kind of smart, but yeah, it's got its hidden treasures. The launch pad and all its fittings were built to withstand the brute force of a launch, which would rattle the pad with intense fire, corrosive exhaust, and thunderous sound waves. Tested, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, there's a, uh, a tremendous amount of force that gets placed, you know, and lift off on the structure, on the mobile launch platform, the MLP, uh, you know, heat, acoustics. Each pad featured a shallow slope concrete pyramid about 40 feet high with a flame trench carved through the middle to channel exhaust away during launch. The launch pads were first built for the Saturn V rockets of the Apollo program. Back then, the launch complex did not have any permanent service towers because the support structure was on a mobile launch platform and traveled with the rocket to the pad. It's an element of the history, you know, to think back and to stand in places where people were launched to the moon, uh, that has a, a, real, a real place for me. For shuttle, a pair of support structures called a fixed service structure, or FSS, and a rotating service structure, or RSS, were built at the pad and would remain there for all 30 years of flights. Both structures carried wiring and other infrastructure needed to support and protect the space shuttle for weeks at a time. A shuttle stack, meaning an orbiter attached to an external fuel tank and a pair of solid rocket boosters, would move to the launch pad about a month before liftoff. The shuttle was connected to networks of data cables, water lines, and the fueling system. Unless you were out there when the, when the workers and technicians and engineers were out there, you really, it's hard to capture the, the elements of, you know, these people working together as a team doing complex tasks, complex jobs, it, it, with, a, with a vehicle there that's just, you know, loaded with solid propellant. It could be dangerous as heck, you know, it really is, I mean. And they did it routinely and uh, made it safe. There's also a bathroom, complete with stainless steel fixtures instead of brittle porcelain. And when we do give a uh, guy, you know, give some tours up there, or groups come up there, I always point out that that's the last toilet on earth. Before launch day, the RSS covered most of the shuttle and provided a clean room that safely moved space probes, space station modules, and even NASA's Hubble Space Telescope into the shuttle's cargo bay without contaminating them. Other parts of the launch pad gave workers access to most areas of the shuttle stack, which stood up to 184 feet above the surface of the mobile launcher platform. The launch pad was woven throughout with propellant lines, wiring, and machinery. There's so many complex things out there that could literally kill you, you know, if you did something wrong, or, or not just yourself, you know, it could be, you know, devastating. And uh, we do it safely, routinely, day in and day out. That's testament to the, to the workforce and to the, 
to what this nation built from the Apollo era, you know, learning through hard lessons. Launch day was also when most of the structures at the pad came to life, mostly by remote control to keep people a safe distance away. The huge white spheres on either side of the shuttle will pump super cold liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into the shuttle's external tank. Each propellant had to flow through long lines from the spheres about a half mile from the shuttle. Uh, as you get closer to launch, you know, things just kind of step up and uh, you, you, just, you can feel it, uh, just pure excitement, you know, <laughs> really, as you're getting closer. The last people at the pad on launch day were the astronauts. They headed into the white room, a kind of cramped locker room, before boarding the shuttle. With two and a half minutes to go, the gaseous oxygen vent arm and its white beanie cap retracted from the top of the external tank, clearing the way for the launch. About 16 seconds before launch, some 300,000 gallons of water poured onto the launch pad. Though it might seem to be done to protect against the blazing fire, the water was actually for sound suppression to dampen the vibrations produced by 7 million pounds of thrust. The fire and thunder would produce a show unlike any other. Go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Two, one. Booster ignition and the final liftoff of Discovery. A tribute to the dedication, hard work, and pride of America's space shuttle team. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Some of our team would work late shifts, so you kind of had to go home and sometimes, you know, watch it from the, the river, just like the other the other folks would, or something like that. Which I, I actually kind of enjoy, you know, if I couldn't make it in the center in time, you know, just kind of being out there with a general general public and everything like that. Just sit back and, and, and watch the kids and people enjoy a, a beautiful launch. You know, it was, it was part of my joy, I guess. Now that the space shuttle is retired, the pads are being prepared for another transition. The structures that mark the space shuttle era have been removed from launch pad 39B, so it can handle several different types of launchers that are expected to make up the next generation of space exploration. Pad 39A, the starting point for some of NASA's most famous flights, including Apollo 11 and the first and last shuttle flights, will look as it did during the shuttle years for the near term, echoing the thundering success of the space shuttle program.